Did you know Mew was inspired by an invisible F4 Phantom fighter jet and a dog that never existed? We know this sounds bizarre, but it's the truth. So buckle up for about 15 years worth of backstory. It's often said that Gen 1 programmer Shigeki Morimoto inserted Mew into red and green as a prank. But that's only a very small piece of the story, and it's not even entirely true. The idea for Mew actually came from Satoshi Tajiri, Game Freak's founder and the creator of the Pokemon franchise. Tajiri is incredibly reclusive and rarely grants interviews, but he did sit down for one gigantic interview at Game Freak headquarters in May 2000, which was later published as 34 pages in a Japan exclusive book called Pokemon Story. In our search for Pokemon Secrets, we recently had those 34 pages translated into English, and what we found was Tajiri's rather bizarre but also completely ingenious explanation for why he came up with Mew. So let's get into it. As a teenager, Tajiri frequently skipped school to spend all day at the local arcade. He fell in love with games like Space Invaders and Xevious, two space shooters he obsessively played in massive marathon sessions. In the interview, he said, I would really try and take these games on, going at it for 12 hours at a time. At the time, I thought, I'm the only guy who's doing this. But in reality, guys like me were springing up all over Japan, and we started to wonder what made the game tick. When that information started to make the rounds as schoolyard rumors, there was a big mixture of truths and half-truths. Xevious was originally designed as a game about the Vietnam War, but adopted a sci-fi theme during development. An F-4 Phantom fighter jet remained in Xevious's internal data as a leftover from its Vietnam roots, but it could never actually be seen by the player. This led to urban legends that while playing Xevious, there was a one in a million chance you'd see an F-4 Phantom. A Space Invaders legend claimed you could fire a perfect shot down the middle to hit the invader in the back for 1500 points. Video game magazines heard these rumors and reported them as fact, which convinced Tajiri and his peers that the rumors were true. Tajiri explains further. There were tons of surreal rumors out there, like a dog running across the screen. Nobody could confirm most of these rumors. You'd hear, a friend of a friend down in Chiba says he totally saw the dog, and you'd think, did he really? There were always things he couldn't verify. I had tons of experiences like that. So when I was making Pokemon, I wondered what kind of legends might spring up. I heard this or that could appear if you do this or something. Let people's imaginations run wild. With those urban legends in mind, I came up with Mew, a character that exists but doesn't appear, just like the F4 Phantom. Legends get talked about and live on. It's these kinds of urban legends that spread through word of mouth that you really feel in your bones. He goes on to say that that what makes Mew special is that unlike the F4 Phantom, players can actually catch and keep it for themselves or trade it to a friend. So it lives on forever instead of appearing for a brief fleeting moment. So Mew was actually Tajiri's idea, not Morimoto's. But what about the design itself? To hear Morimoto's side of the story, we need to move over to Game Freak's official YouTube channel. The channel was created in 2018 and top developers like Junichi Masuda practically beg their fans to subscribe to it. But but as of 2021, they've still only managed to pull in 40,000 subscribers. But despite its low view counts, there are actually some hidden gems in there, including two interviews with Morimoto where he revealed some secrets about Mew's creation. They're all in Japanese without subtitles, so we translated both videos as well. According to Morimoto, Game Freak wanted a Pokemon that could serve as Mewtwo's origin. Red and Green already had references to Mew scattered throughout Cinnabar's Pokemon Mansion, but Mew didn't have a sprite, stats, or anything tangible. In that sense, it was sort of like the original dragon from Gen 5. A creature you hear stories about, but only exists for the sake of the game's lore, and you never get to see it. After Pokemon's six-year development, Nintendo spent a fortune debugging the game. In another interview, Tajiri says it was the most expensive debugging process in Nintendo history. Game Freak was under strict orders not to tamper with the game after debugging was complete, but removing the debug features freed up a tiny amount of space on the cartridge, about 300 bytes. Game Freak already had to cut lots of Pokemon so Red and Green could fit
fit on a Game Boy cartridge, but now they had just enough space left over to squeeze in one more Pokemon. Originally, it was supposed to be Ken Sugimori who would design Mew. After all, he was the guy who designed Mew 2 and the art director, so it was natural that he'd do the honors. Then, as the programmer, it was Morimoto's job to physically add Mew into the game. But as Morimoto explains it, I asked Sugimori if he could design it, but he never made the time to do it for me. There was no time left. Like, Mew had to get put into the game now or it wasn't gonna happen. I had no choice but to design it myself. I made its Pokedex entry and it stats and all that. Then I just put it in. He goes on to explain why Mew's design is so small and simple. 300 bytes just wasn't enough space for a large and detailed Pokemon sprite. So while Mewtwo and the legendary birds have sprites that are 56 pixels squared, Mew's sprite is only 40 pixels. Morimoto says there wasn't even enough space to color it in, which is why the Mew we know today is pretty much one solid color. Morimoto notes that even though the lore says Mewtwo was created as Mew's clone, in reality, the opposite is true. Mewtwo came first, and Mew was created essentially as a simplified clone of Mewtwo. Everyone at Game Freak was in on the plan, but no one told Nintendo. They eventually found out when fans started encountering a glitch that made Mew appear in their games. Nintendo was furious, but their anger subsided pretty quickly as urban legends about Mew lit up the imagination of fans, just as the dogs and phantoms had done for Xevious a decade earlier. Red and Green sold decently right out the gate, but sales exploded as rumors about a secret 151st Pokemon started spreading around Japanese playgrounds. According to Pokemon Company President Tsunakazu Ishihara, the monthly sales we had had up to then began to be equaled by weekly sales before increasing to become three, then four times larger. By the time it ranked number one in weekly sales, more than a year and a half had gone by since the game was first released. Pokemon might have never become such a huge hit if it wasn't for Mew, and probably never would have been localized into six languages and become the worldwide success it is today. One of the biggest urban legends was that Mew was hidden under a truck near the SS Anne, which you could only reach by engaging in a mild amount of tomfoolery. That was just a baseless rumor, of course. In reality, there was nothing anywhere near the truck, but the rumor eventually made it all the way to Game Freak HQ. So in honor of the urban legends that inspired Mew in the first place, they hid an invisible lava cookie by the truck as an Easter egg in Fire Red and Leaf Green. And in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, they left a revive that respawns once a day in the exact same location. The rumor was also referenced in Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, where there's a beauty who says, there's no Pokemon under a truck, maybe you'll just find a muck. Fans seem to have fixated on that particular spot because it's the only truck in Kanto, which led them to believe it must have some significance. But actually, it's nothing more than a leftover from earlier in development. In 2019, red and green prototype assets were leaked and then published by preservationist group Helix Chamber, including this proto map of Kanto, which includes a small city in the center that was cut from the game's final build. This proto map matches the 1990 concept art that labels the Lost City with the letter C. If we zoom in on the Lost City, we can see the exact same truck parked right out front. So after reworking Kanto, it appears Game Freak just never bothered to remove the old truck tile set from that rarely visited corner of the map, or they might have even forgot it was there. The legend of the truck and all the other urban legends about Mew were just a bunch of schoolyard rumors. The truth was that Mew could only really be seen with a glitch. In those video interviews, Morimoto admits that he programmed the glitch into the games himself, although it was completely by accident. The mistake was mostly due to the fact he had virtually zero programming experience before working on red and green. But luckily, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as the Mew glitch was arguably the best thing that ever happened to Pokemon. Once the secret about Mew became public knowledge, Game Freak decided to host a Mew giveaway through Japanese magazine Koro Koro Comics. More than 70,000 fans mailed in letters hoping to acquire one of the only legitimate Mew in existence, but only 20 lucky winners were chosen. The number was kept so low because Morimoto had to personally create each Mew on his computer, then manually transfer them to the winner's cartridges with a standard Game Boy Link cable. He gave each Mew unique ID numbers ranging from 0001 to 0020, making them the rarest Pokemon to ever exist. To this day, he still says Mew's his favorite Pokemon. Morimoto
photo even made Mew part of his signature. Here you can see what it looks like when he signs his autograph. So Tajiri came up with the idea of Mew and Morimoto made the design, stats, cry and Pokedex entry. But the Mew he snuck into red and green was still far from finished. Like all Gen 1 Pokemon, Mew's sprite was designed first. Then art director Ken Sugimori came back later and made revisions with his watercolor artwork. Sugimori discusses this in depth in his 2014 art book, which we also translated into English. He says, Each artist's sprites retain their individuality. The appeal of Pokemon comes from the wide range and diversity of designs. There's so many designs mixed together that couldn't have possibly all come from the same mind. But the only images for Pokemon we had were their sprites, so I had to draw them all anew, based on the pixel art. I also modified design elements that I was displeased with. That's how they all became my characters, in a way. And since then, I've been in charge of unifying the designs of all Pokemon. Apparently, the part Sugimori was displeased with was the fetus aesthetic, which he dialed down significantly. And through Sugimori's revisions and unification process, Morimoto's original design gradually evolved into a Mew that's barely recognizable as the same creature. In fact, we never even got to see Morimoto's Mew in the West, since that original sprite was only ever used in the Japanese red and green. But even after Tajiri, Morimoto, and Sugimori's contributions, Mew was still just a collection of images showing what it looked like from the front and from behind. Who created its three dimensions? appearance, its personality, and its trademark floaty movements. No one at Game Freak can take credit for those details. They were actually made two years later by OLM Inc, the animation team who worked on Mewtwo Strikes Back. On Game Freak's official channel, Morimoto looked back with amazement at how they brought his 40 pixel sprite to life, saying, you know, that was the first Pokemon movie ever made. So I went to go see it and I was like, whoa, Mew is moving. Mew has such a huge role in this movie. I I made that Pokemon. It was very emotional. So much so that I watched it in America too. When you think about it, all I did was make the sprite. To see it move around was so cool. During this video's production, we got a chance to speak with OLM's Sayuri Ichishi, who confirmed for us that she was the one who drew Mew from every angle. She made these reference sheets for the first movie, along with Mew's iconic animations. Sayuri was also animation director on the very first anime episode, and a big part of her job is taking Sugimori's still images and faithfully bringing them to life. And he must be pretty satisfied with her work, because they've brought her back again and again. And as of this video, she's done animation for pretty much every Pokemon movie ever made. From the 80s arcade to the first movie's release in 1998, it took about 15 years for four creators driven by the urban legends spread by millions of fans to create the Mew we know today. In Pokemon lore, Mew gave birth to all life, but in reality, you could say it was all life who gave birth to Mew. Usually, we buy all our videos a bunch of fake likes on the Ukrainian dark web, but this week, we spent that whole budget on all these Japanese translations. So if you enjoyed this video, do us a favor and leave us a real like. Okay, that's a joke, but seriously, we hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, maybe next time we'll do one about Celebi. Also, we want to give a big thanks to our translators, Anthony Madri and Jacob Newcomb. And also, thanks to Dogasu's Backpack for the Koro Koro scans, L Aleph, Snorlax Monster, and High Res Pokemon for helping us get our hands on that 34 page Tajiri interview. Thanks for watching, and if you want more rumors about Pokemon, check out the Did You Know Gaming video on the complete history of Pokemon rumors. I have been your guest host, Max Mofo, and if you want more from me, feel free to come by my channel, Max Mofo Pokemon, and watch me get upset at children's playing cards. Goodbye!